Hi there, and welcome back to the Digital Money Revolution. I'm your host, Chris Coney. Now in this lesson, we're gonna go into the question of what is money, really? If we go back to our definition here, we've now moved on to Bitcoin with a small b, which is the currency that runs on the Bitcoin network. And the first part of my definition here is that it says that a Bitcoin is a unit of digital currency. So let's take a look at that. So we call Bitcoin a cryptocurrency. This is a new sort of phrase that people have started to throw around. And there's now a lot of different cryptocurrencies. We've explored the fact that the crypto part is the cryptography, which we covered in the lesson on encryption. So logically, a cryptocurrency must be a currency that's encrypted. And only the owner of each bit of currency has the key to unlock it. And when we get to Bitcoin wallets, we're going to look at that a bit more closely. Now, Bitcoin is also called a digital currency. But the thing about making something digital is that it immediately makes it easy to copy. And actually, almost you can copy it with almost no cost. If you think about piracy, or you think about the disruption that digital music caused, before we had digital music, the only way to copy music was to physically take a plastic CD and copy it in a physical sense. And because there's a manufacturing cost there, that sort of discouraged piracy. You could still probably copy it at home, but it made it more difficult. And so when music became digital, all of a sudden it made it, made it free to copy it, and that caused a lot of problems. And all digital goods have this problem of piracy and being easy to copy. And the internet, as great as it is, because it's digital and because everything's moved online, everything's been moved into the digital world. It makes this problem uh, bigger and bigger for all kinds of different industries. So you might ask the question, well, can I just copy my Bitcoins and make myself an instant millionaire? Well, no, because there's, there has to be consensus on the network about how much is in your Bitcoin wallet. So when you make a transaction, that money's moved out of your wallet into someone else's, and then everyone knows about it. And that's determined by all the transactions that have ever been made. Because when you make a Bitcoin transaction, the network knows that looking at where that Bitcoin came from, it came into your wallet at some point, but it came from the person that paid it to you, and they got it from someone else who got it from someone else who got it from someone else. So every single transaction is tracked. So you can't just magically create Bitcoins in your wallet. You have to prove that those Bitcoins were sent to you by someone in the past. And that's all available on the blockchain and everyone already agrees on that. So you can't manipulate it. Now going on to the currency more generally, at the most basic level, a currency is the thing that we use to buy stuff, okay? So if that's true, well, can I just use air as money? Well, no, you can't. And why not? Well, because money is too easy to get hold of on your own. If I offer you some air in exchange for your car, you'll say, well, no, because I can get some air for free just by doing this, right? So it's not worth anything to you. In addition to that, no one else is willing to accept air as payment. So if you, even if you took the air, then you'd have to turn around and be able to offer that to someone else and they'd say the same thing. They'd say, well, no, I'm not taking air as payment because I can get some very easily for free. So why should I accept it as payment? It has no value. Now that is a very, very, very important point. Money is whatever someone is willing to accept as payment. So keep that in your mind. If, if I offered you a blank piece of paper as payment and you accepted that blank piece of paper as payment, it's currency, but it's simple as that. So here's a question, are these money? American dollars, is that money? British pounds, is that money? European euros or Japanese yen or Indian rupees? Well, the answer is yes and no. The reason why the answer is yes and no is because in one country, yes, and in another country, no. So why do those countries accept those methods as payment and why don't others? Well, I mentioned money has value because we can spend it. And in any given country, what is the ultimate place money is spent? Where's the one place you have no choice over where you spend your money and the form that that takes? 
This is the government. Because the government collects taxes and they get to decide what currency you have to pay your taxes in. And of course, every country has a government. So that government says the national currency in the United Kingdom is British pounds and you will pay your taxes in British pounds. So the governments in each country kind of have a stranglehold on what can be used as currency. They'll allow people to barter and trade in anything. But at the end of the day, when it comes to paying the government taxes, you have to have some national currency. So the question is, could I accept dollars as payment? Well, me as a British citizen, yes, I could, but I'd have to convert some of it to pounds when it came time to pay taxes. Or I'd have to find someone else in the UK that would accept dollars as payment. And if I couldn't find anybody, I'd have to change it back into British pounds because almost everybody in the country, pretty much everybody in the country, accepts pounds as payment, which is how come it continues to be used. And I'd also have to tell the government how much I earned in dollars so that they could charge me the right amount of tax on my earnings. So here's another question. How does the government decide what to use as money or currency? Well, they'll ask these questions. There's actually five criteria for a good currency. So the currency has to be portable because you have to be able to give it to someone else when you spend it with them. It has to be durable, right? If I have some sort of currency, like a British pound note, if I put it in my wallet and then come back the next day, I wanna make sure it hasn't disintegrated because otherwise I've lost my money. So there's a confidence thing, it has to be durable. And then over time, you know, it has to be durable over many, many years. It has to be recognizable. So in the United Kingdom, if I go to a coffee shop and I present a five pound note, that person needs to be able to recognize and be confident that, that is in fact a five pound note. Now the, tr the trouble here is, if you want to fr uh, create fraud, you could potentially create a counterfeit. You could create what looks like a five pound note and if it was a good copy and you gave that to someone, they would believe, they would recognize it as a five pound note and accept it as payment. So that's a problem there. Another thing is this word's called fungible. Fungible means that one unit of currency is exactly the same as the next one. So if I got two brand new five pound notes, one was yours and one was mine, we put them on the table and we mixed them up, mixed them up, mixed them up, and then we lost track of whose was which five pound note, it wouldn't really matter. Each one of us just takes one of the five pound notes and we've both still got five pounds. We don't really care which one it is because we know that if we give it to someone else, they've both got five pounds worth of value. And finally, scarce. This is interesting. This is why we couldn't use air as currency because it fails the test. Air is so abundant, it's so easy to get hold of, it has no value. So when we get onto more of the economic stuff about the economy and how the economy works, you'll see that scarcity, the, the more rare something is, generally the more value it has. So that's another thing. So in summary, money is whatever someone is willing to accept as payment. We went through that. The more people accept the thing as payment, the stronger the currency is. If you're the only person in the world that will accept my blank piece of paper as currency, it's a very weak currency. So with Bitcoin, the more people adopt Bitcoin, the more people begin to use it, the more people begin accepting it as payment, the stronger it gets. And this all boils down to people who use the currency having confidence in it. So that's like trust. And uh, do I trust that that currency you're giving me has value and can I spend it with someone else? And will they have confidence that it has value? And those five characteristics that we went through, those are the things that make sure people that will trust it and that it will last and be spendable in the future. So durability and all that kind of thing, recognizable. These are all of the things that maintain trust in the currency and get everyone to continue using it. And finally, the government in each country typically sets the laws on what can be used as currency. And then they collect taxes in that currency, which is typically why the same currency continues to be used in that country, because at the end of the day, everyone has to pay tax. So that's an overview of what money really is, or actually that was currency, what currency really is. 
There is a difference between money and currency, but we'll get to that a bit later. Now we're going to come back to some of these concepts later on, but we've just laid the first layer of understanding there. So if you've still got questions on this stuff, take patience. We're going to come back to it at a different level and connect it with everything else. So that's all for this lesson. I will see you in the next video. So it's bye for now.